cowards in the home of the brave, who would rather solve problems with an arsenal than an engaged conversation. In times between wars, the times between wars now has collapsed. I think since 9-11, but I'm not even sure if it wasn't collapsed before then. Now, our vision is both nearsighted inward and farsighted outward. And we are caught in a nightmare of realization that not only are the world's problems here, but we are the world. Privilege is no longer a blessing. It's also a curse, a curse against others but also, in the end, a curse against ourselves. In the 8th century before Christ, the ruler of the northern kingdom, Jogam II, had not only successfully restored King Solomon's kingdom, but he had expanded on it. And the kingdom fell into a time of relative peace and relative prosperity. With attention no longer needed outside the borders, a proverbial spotlight turned inward, and what did they find? Social corruption and the, oppress, the oppression of the poor and the helpless. Privilege was no longer a blessing. It was also a curse. Under the cover of nationalistic and military zeal, those with power, prestige, possessions, and prosperity, blessings they assumed by God, were cursing those without power, prestige, possessions, and prosperity. In times of peace, the privileged tried to cover themselves, and the curse they were bringing onto God's people with religious zeal. Hosting these elaborate, sacred festivals during which there was great indulgence and revel. Amos, the Lord's prophet, came into the midst of all this abuse of power and religious self-righteousness with a warning. Pay attention to what you are doing. Repent of what you are doing and get back to what God wills for you. Or, suffer the consequences of your own doing. To Damascus, who engaged the, in the wasteful destruction of the neighboring community's food supply. To Gaza and Tyre, who enslaved whole communities and sold humans as possessions. To Edom, whose anger raged continually and whose fury flamed unchecked, to Amnon, who assaulted pregnant women, to Moab, who slaughtered someone's king, to, Ju to Judah, who was led, led astray by false gods. Against all of these neighbors of Israel, there will be judgment, says the prophet Amos. However, on the privileged, on the chosen ones, on the ones set aside for holiness, on the ones who have made it, on the ones who have it a little easier than everybody else, on the ones who are supposed to know the difference, who are supposed to know better. God has a special judgment. Finally, to Israel, Amos writes, who sell the innocent for silver, and the needy for a pair of sandals, who trample on the heads of the poor as on the dust of the ground and deny justice to the oppressed, who generationally use and demean women and steal from the devout to make themselves look better. God says, I will crush you as a cart crushes when loaded with grain. I'm just reading from the Bible here. And they say that we liberals don't talk about sin and punishment. Hmm. Tell me. If corruption.
corruption is working for you. How hard is it to put that aside? What, won't God make an exception if we're going somewhere to get it right every week? If you are benefiting from the fleecing of the poor, what motivation do you have to stop? Well, yeah, besides the judgment of God, and if we make our religious pe penance, God's going to say it's okay, right? If owning a semi-automatic weapon, a weapon of war, does, does what God would do if God were real, if it makes you feel more powerful and more certain and more secure in a world that diminishes your power and makes you nervous, why would you not defend your right to own one? But then if you can't prevent someone from badgering you, from nagging you, from screaming at you, from hounding at you, from bothering you, from just being in your presence by one simple, swift movement of a finger, why would you not pull that trigger? If the oppressed aren't complaining, then they must enjoy being oppressed. Or want to be oppressed. Or deserve to be oppressed. Or see, they aren't even oppressed at all. Have you heard these things? But if they are complaining, how dare they complain and create so much trouble for the good people of the world? If those folks out in Dallas had not been peacefully protesting, someone said just days ago, we wouldn't have dead police officers. If that guy wasn't selling CDs, he wouldn't have gotten shot. If that kid didn't just go to the grocery store for his mom, he wouldn't have been mistaken for a hoodlum. If that little girl didn't hug her daddy quite so tight, if that little boy wasn't in a youth group or a scout troop, if that woman hadn't gone to her pastor for counseling, for support, for a, world of, for a word of praise, if that rape victim hadn't been running in the park in those tight running clothes or trusted her her date, her husband, her boss, her maintenance man, maybe they wouldn't have been assaulted. Maybe if the poor, the lowly, the victimized, the wounded, the lonely, the forsaken, the vulnerable would just stop being poor and lowly and victims and wounded and lonely and forsaken and vulnerable, we, the privileged, wouldn't have to minister to them. My friends, are you squirming in the pews like I'm squirming, saying it? Yet, this is the response? This is the response? That people who speak up and speak out against the injustice in the world get? In declaring that something is wrong in the world today? Seriously? And this is what Amos heard when he's trying to do the same. Amos calls on his world to repent, to turn around, to refuse to be complicit, to bring people down a notch saying, you have turned justice into poison and the fruit of righteousness into bitterness. That might just be my favorite line. It's 612B, if you're keeping track. And the head priest at Bethel tells him, get out, you, you, you seer. Go back to where you came if you're so unhappy. I kid you not, it's in there, 712. Don't prophesy here because this sanctuary belongs to the king. This sanctuary belongs to the kingdom. This sanctuary belongs to the political and economic system. This sanctuary no longer belongs to God. It belongs to the gods of human power. And what is God's response to all of this through the prophet Amos? Okay. Okay, fine. Then my chosen ones, my beloved ones, my privileged ones, my responsible ones will be exiled from their own land. We live and die by what we sow. The 
territory that they have so diligently defended and declared to be their own, even against God, will be measured, divided up, and you yourselves, says God, through Amos, will die in a pagan country. You will get what you demand. You will indeed be left alone. There aren't very many places in scripture where God, through anybody, says, I hate, except in the prophet Amos. I hate, I despise your religious festivals, your assemblies are a stench to you. Even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. If, though you bring choice fellowship offerings, I will have no regard of them. Away with the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your harps, but let justice roll down like a river and righteousness like an ever-falling stream. We've heard that before. But one thing that I've never noticed, that I didn't notice, of that oft-quoted passage until I was coming home from Maryland, grieving and thinking and breathing. The plasticity of those festivals, the falseness of those assemblies, the generous offerings meant to bribe God and cover up the truth. The music meant to drown out the cries of the unprivileged. It's all replaced by what? By God-created gifts of cool, simple, natural water. Rivers of justice and streams of righteousness. Maybe what we need to replace this seemingly endless cycle of violence and vengeance, hostility and hatred, maybe what we need to replace this thing that we have created 